Well, whether we're streamed or not, I think we need to get underway. So, good afternoon, good morning. It's still technically good morning. Good morning, people. Um, my name is David Hyman. I am president of the Center for Technology and Workforce Solutions. We are a new think tank here in Washington looking at how to get more people into and retained in tech and tech-enabled careers, do so with equity, and get folks prepared for the jobs of the future. And I will be your moderator today for this panel. Um, I would like to briefly, uh, but thoroughly, introduce each of the panelists and then get right into our talks. And of course, there will be time at the end for some questions from all of you, which we are, I think, universally looking forward to. So, um, starting at the far end of the table, I'd like to introduce everybody to uh, Tiffany Shackelford. She serves as both Chief Strategic Officer and Director of Communications for the National Governors Association, working with a variety of the organization's stakeholders, including governors and their staff, to implement effective strategies. Tiffany came to the NGA after multiple senior strategic roles in communications and strategy in the nonprofit and startup sector. Uh, to her right, is uh, Dr. Sean Duberback. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Digital Destiny, How the New Age of Data Will Transform the Way We Work, Live, and Communicate. A very good read. Which explores how the world's mass adoption of digital technologies portends the beginning of a new era for humanity in the realms of business, healthcare, finance, transportation, and culture. Sean's also the president and CEO of Avrio Institute, a research institute focused on emerging technologies and their impact on diverse industries. Uh, moving along uh, next to Sean, we have Kenneth DeGraff. He's a senior policy advisor to the Speaker of the House, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, focusing on energy, climate, technology, and science issues. Before joining uh, Leader Pelosi's staff, he was legislative director to Congressman Mike Doyle, who we all heard this morning. Uh, prior to that, he was a policy analyst at Consumer Reports. Uh, next, we have retired U.S. Army Brigadier General Carol Eggert. She's senior vice president for military and veteran affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. In this role, she provides strategic leadership to the company's military engagement in hiring, corporate social responsibility efforts, and business development. Carol's military career included many overseas deployments, and she is the recipi recipient of numerous awards and commendations in recognition of her contributions to the military, including the Legion of Merit, Bronze Star, and Purple Heart. We're not worthy. We're not Indeed. worthy. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Liz Schuler. Liz is the Secretary Treasurer and Chief finan Financial Officer of the AFL CIO, the second top level officer for the Federation, the first woman elected to the position, and the youngest woman to sit on the Federation's Executive Council. In addition to overseeing the Federation's operations and finances, Liz leads at the AFL-CIO on initiatives around the future of work, workforce development and training, industrial union councils, and women and young workers' economic empowerment. Thank you. That's all the time we have today. <laughs> um, I, I am honored to be sitting at, at a table with such a, a an incredible group of folks. Um, I, I want to start our discussions today um, with this. Um, Americans are concerned with how technologies like artificial intelligence and robots will affect their future. Uh, one in five Americans believe th uh, these technologies will create more jobs than they eliminate. Just 20% of the people. 
Nearly half the people believe these innovations will eliminate more jobs than they create. So if we could, let's start with a look back. So what are the historical patterns of innovation? New technologies, their impact on uh, legacy sectors. What does it tell us about the future of the jobs? Uh, for instance, the carriage and buggy industry, uh, they were decimated, right, by the automobile industry. But in the end, because of the automobile industry, there were so many more jobs and opportunities and industries that were created. So uh, I'd, I'd sort of like to start with a general uh, look at this. And Tiffany, if you don't mind, I'm wondering, how are the governors, and certainly by extension the NGA, preparing for the technological disruption that people are very concerned about? Uh, and its impact on the workforce and, of course, their lives. So they mostly sweat and make a lot of jokes. Um, no, that's just me. That's what I do. Um, that's a great question, and I, I want to want everyone to know that governors in particular have this at the top of their mind. We have our winter meeting coming up in three weeks, and most of the sessions, in fact, are focused on innovation, workforce, and entrepreneurship. So it couldn't be more top of mind for our governors. Um, in addition, our organization, and we are the trade association that supports all 55 governors of the states and territories, just well, can't forget our territories. Um, and one of the things that we as an organization are shifting to is a very innovative approach to how we think about policy. We use an iterative, agile approach for everything. We use design-based thinking to get to there. And we also are not afraid to fail because we understand that in order to innovate properly, that's always part of the conversation. And we try to bring this thinking to governor's offices every day, particularly with our newly elected 20 plus. Um, and a couple of, this isn't new for us actually. We've been dealing with the idea of innovating while governing at the same time for many years. Now that's a challenge obviously, as you can imagine. You know, you've got to think about the jobs of today while thinking about the jobs of the future. You've got to assure those left behind that everything is going to be okay while trying to figure out what the future is going to bring. Um, our previous chair, former Governor Sandoval of Nevada, used a chairmanship to highlight innovations coming to energy and transportation, for instance. Um, autonomous vehicles, robotics, and how that will impact jobs in the states. Um, and in 2017, we launched the association's first emerging issues and technologies policy practice. We call it NGA Future. Kind of obvious, I suppose, but that's it. Um, it's a permanent office, and we're really, all that, all that uh, my colleague Tim, who's right here, say hi, um, does is really help governors think through disruption, technology, innovation, and what that is going to do to their states in the immediate future. Um, our current chair, the governor of Montana, Steve Bullock, is using his chairmanship to focus on good jobs for all Americans. And that weaves together questions around rural economic opportunity, equal access to jobs, and also, of course, the future of work. And what that really looks like, particularly for Americans who perhaps were forgotten and are not on the coast. Um, I'd also say, just finally, that NGA really advises governors on the way they staff for this challenge. We encourage governors to set up offices of innovation or infuse innovative and entrepreneurial thinking throughout their cabinets. Um, in the last year or so, we've seen a few governors kind of get on board with this. Governor Murphy in New Jersey appointed a chief innovation officer. And the new governor of Maine, Governor Joyce Mills, apparently in a Kerouac fantasy, also uh, put together of a governor, an office of innovation and the future. So we're, we're very excited to see that. We're also, you know, really again, encouraging governors. You can't just say, innovate all over the state. That's not gonna work, that's not gonna be effective. But think about how you can create smaller startups, create smaller pockets of innovation within the state that can really work and what that, what that works. Almost niche innovation, if you will. Find out where you, where you are. One last example, and then I'll zip it up, is um, in Nevada, they needed to get past just being gaming and mining for their economy. They figured out that there was geothermal opportunities. Now they've got deals with Poland, with Queensland, Australia, with their innovative geothermal technology. So really thinking about where you can innovate in the smartest ways, in quick ways. Um, Liz, what, roles, what role can the unions play uh, in helping working people manage these effects that are, that are sure to come? 
Well, I want to thank David, and uh, of course, um, it's so great to be here with this panel because I think this is what we need more of is diverse viewpoints and robust conversation, including having a worker perspective, which often we don't include when we're talking about the future of work, which is kind of ironic, right? <laughs> but you would think you would want to know from a working person's point of view how this is going to land. Um, and we do represent 12 and a half million working men and women in the country uh, across all sectors of the economy. Um, I think, I don't know if folks in the audience have much experience with unions. Can I see a show of hands if anyone? Okay, probably someone in your family or maybe yourselves. Um, I don't take that for granted anymore um, because un unfortunately, as we know, unions have been in decline in the, in the private sector um, as of late, but we think there is no more robust a time for people to come together in this economy and have a voice in how these changes are going to take place. And if you think about the disruption that we're expecting, um, the, there's a lot of fear out there among working people. Uh, we can't deny that. The stories that you hear about the, and that you read about are all about robots taking our jobs, right? So I think our job as a labor movement is really to think about how we prepare people, um, both you know, educationally speaking, um, I know training and skills development we think is a, is a primary role that the labor movement can play in this shift, uh, but also on the policy side, uh, because we know that um, technology isn't inherently good or bad, it's what we choose to do with it and how we choose to deploy it, right? And the policy decisions that we make as a country as to how that gets implemented. Um, so we think the labor movement will have a robust um, role to play in that policy arena because we know that a lot of people could get very, very wealthy uh, in terms of how technology is used and deployed, but how are we going to make sure that we're sharing the benefits of technology throughout our society and with work and um, along with the working people who are help, helping to create that wealth? Um, so that's on the policy side and certainly collective bargaining is the tool we use now with the labor movement where employers and workers come together and you know sit across the table and talk about okay how exactly should technology be used in our work environment and and in terms of you know the profits that come about from it and the productivity that you see gained um, so workers actually have a voice in that process if you're in a union environment unfortunately there are fewer and fewer people in that situation um, where they don't have unions in their workplace. So that's something to think about is in the future, what does that kind of collective voice or collective action look like so that working people um, can have a voice in this process? And then the second piece is, um, as I mentioned, um, talent and how uh, talent is used and upskilled and deployed across sectors. Um, we think it'll be very fluid in the future, right? There's no longer someone just training to be a particular job, showing up in one location for 30 years and then <laughs> retiring, right? So we think the labor movement has great experience in being that um, sort of portable um, source for skills uh, as well as benefits so that if employers want to come together in a particular sector, want to invest in um, their talent and upskilling, that the labor movement can play a role in it because we've been doing it for over 100 years uh, and have great examples with apprenticeship uh, and the way uh, talent can be deployed in a particular industry. Fabulous. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to come back to the concept of training, upskilling, portability of skills, et cetera. But um, I wanted to, we've, we've heard uh, a little bit from the workforce angle, we've heard a little bit from the state side. Uh, Kenneth, um, is Congress looking into these issues? And has this been done before? So I, I thanks, thank you, and thank you, David, for, for uh, spearheading this panel. Um, and thanks to everyone else for, for being here, too. I brought with me a copy of a report from Congress from the Joint Economic Committee um, on a hearing from a report on automation and its impact on the economy and the workforce. Anybody want to want to guess the year this report was written? Just guess some years if you want. 1955. 
right? The report's fascinating because it actually just goes into great detail about the kind of jobs that were going to get lost over the last 64 years, the kind of jobs that were going to be created in this, in this economy, what we needed to do to prevent um, the worst kinds of harms, job training, making sure that, that communities aren't, aren't uh, negatively affected. Um, it talks about the danger, about the shortage of scientists and skilled labor and what we need to do to prevent that. But there's a fascinating quote in here, and I wanted to read it to, so we can get talk about this um, on the panel today. There was a quote that they recognize that some people are going to get screwed over by a transition, right? And that some businesses were so busy as to be, quote, unaware of their responsibility for helping to solve the problems of the person who finds their skills obsoleted overnight. They go into automation's impact on rural communities and small towns, and they say, quote, happily, this indifference to personal hardships was not widespread in the business community. Think about that 64 years ago and where we are today, where work is not valued, home health aides are paid minimum wage, where we live in a society where families are living paycheck to paycheck, and the richest 1% just got a huge tax cut, 83% of which of the $1.5 trillion was given to the richest 1%, right? So how have we spent our money in the past few years? Are we setting ourselves up for success for the future, or are we making the right investments that we need to make in our people, in our infrastructure, and in our education systems? Are we doing those things? Are we ready for the future? I, I would, po I would posit that we are not. I would, I would look welcome to people challenging that. But I do want to talk about what we're doing in the, in the going forward. Um, I encourage people to take a look at A Better Deal, uh, Tools for the 21st Century, House Democrats put together this, this um, and, I, and I won't go into huge detail about it now, but um, we can maybe talk about it a little bit later. There are, we have some big ideas for how we need to invest in our people, our workforce, and our infrastructure, and change some of the big incentives that have, uh, I think, driven the business economy in ways that have been hurtful to working families, right? So there's an emphasis on short-term profits, not on long-term growth. We can work on all those things, and we talk about how we're going to do that in that, in that document. Thank you, sir. Um, Carol, can you talk about the human piece of this? Well, I'll, I'll start with, first of all, thank you. I think it's quite unusual to have a military perspective at a state of the net. Um, so I'm just grateful that we thought, hey, let's, let's bring in a military lens on some of this. Um, and I think there's a great misunderstanding, uh, uh, a knowledge gap between what the military does in this arena and what the private sector does. Um, the military faces the same challenges that any organization does with acquiring talent. However, it's our national security is at risk if we can't meet those demands now that we have an all-volunteer force. And the military missions have increased in frequency and in complexity and in technology technological requirements that I think we still have a narrative of tanks on the battlefield and tents and, and infantry marches across the Folda Gap, and that is no longer the narrative. And then that creates an issue that we're missing an entire talent pool that's out there as we transition from military service. And about 250,000 transition a year. Um, and if you think about the demographics and some of the things we're looking for in our civilian workforce, the military is already doing it. It's a multi-generational workforce. Uh, it requires everyone to be very innovative, technologically uh, educated and knowledgeable. We have something called new equipment training that is just standard. Who has the biggest budget? Don't yell at me. But it's the <laughs> DOD. And of course, they're always increasing um, their, their um, level of technology. And so individuals who serve have to be a knowledge workforce. But I think when they get out, we're missing a lot of talent because less than 1% serve. And so therefore, there is a knowledge gap or a civ mill divide. And so when we get to the private sector, how many of you are actually seeking out that talent? and understanding what that talent brings to the workforce. So I think if I would say anything, it's that let's look at military <coughs> talent. I don't know if you're aware that as we have an all-volunteer force, less than uh, about 71% of 17 to 24-year-olds do not qualify for the military. They cannot enter the all-volunteer force. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It's due to health, physical fitness, education, and um, criminal or moral violations. 
So when you do get somebody out of the military, you're getting the best of the best that was able to get in. But if we don't know that, we're thinking people joined the military because they had no other option. And you've got the forever GI Bill, so this is a highly educated workforce. I got my PhD using the GI Bill, and that's not uncommon. But unless our civilian workforce understands that. So that's what it means for all of us in the room. Let's look at that talent. And I'm proud of Comcast that they started a team. I have a team of eight folks reporting to the president because they knew they needed that talent mm -hmm. and they needed somebody who understood the military to be able to access that talent and to be able, the greatest challenge though is not accessing the talent, it's educating our civilian managers, hiring managers, supervisors on what that talent brings. Um, how many <coughs> of you have ever hired a military veteran? <coughs> so not a lot, not overwhelming, because if we don't understand what we're looking at, we're not gonna hire. So, Thank you for letting me bring that perspective. I think it definitely impacts the workforce of the future. I think the military is quiet about the fact that they are the workforce of the future as demanded by the all-volunteer force. But unless our civilian private sector understands that, we won't be bringing those skills to our workforce. Um, in our next block of discussion, uh, we're gonna be talking about skills and <coughs> come back to you in terms of how the military uh, assesses skills. But before we get there, um, I wanted to turn to Sean for a moment and and sort of get a, a, a doctoral perspective. Um, in terms of the, the timeline of things, uh, we, we hear, you know, oh, the robots are coming to take us away, uh, at mm -hmm. least our jobs. Uh, and what, what's the timeline here? What are we looking at? So, Carol, you've convinced me we should all be hiring uh, military. You did a wonderful job. So, um, by show of hands, I, how May I just interrupt? I would say, I'm not asking you to hire military. Please interview. We have found that those who interview have a higher propensity to get an offer but we can't beat the challenge of interviewing. Get them in so the that's door. all I'm asking. Well, you've, you've convinced me. You've, <laughs> you've done a very good job. Um, so how many of you have ridden in a driverless Uber or driver, driverless Lyft? Show of hands. That's a couple, one. One, okay, one, two. So how many people were in that car when you got in that car? So there's, the way they're doing it, right, is they have a driver and they have an engineer. And so this is, this is, I think, one of the things as we think about the transition through technological evolutions that, that we miss when we think about jobs. Those technologies, as they deploy, actually will create the sense that, that there are more jobs in that space before the vacuum comes. So you'll see an increase in driver jobs as a result of us testing self-driving vehicles in these markets before you see the, the vacuum of those, those driverless jobs uh, that, that, uh, that come about. So technology moves very, very slowly until suddenly it doesn't. And, and that's the part that we don't do a very good job of preparing for. We see it on the horizon, uh, but, but I would argue as a country, we do a very good job at responding to things when they're tomorrow, but not necessarily responding to things when they're decades away. And that's what some of these uh, technological shifts are going to bring is decade long changes. When you look at something like 5G, it's about a decade deployment that's going to not just change the way you use cellular techno technology today, but entirely new services that will be born out in 10 years time. And it's the same with the case with, with automation is, it, it percolates and it shows up in small places before uh, inevitably it comes to, to all of us. And, and I think that uh, most industries don't recognize the impact that it will have on them. So if you take, you know, for example, I, I took um, some executives and broadcast around and showed them robot delivery systems. And they say, well, robot delivery systems don't impact my job. We broadcast radio. We don't need to worry about about physically delivering goods. But what robot delivery systems do, what automating that particular piece of the supply chain does is takes people out of their vehicles. No longer are there delivery trucks coming to your doors, so there's no, dr no drivers in the driver's seats. No longer are you going to the malls to pick things up or to shop. And so as a result, 
then it has an impact on these adjacent industries that they weren't, weren't ready for. So these technologies, uh, I think sometimes we think about them too narrowly. That would be the second point that I would make. When you think about self-driving cars, for example, we're, we're so focused on drivers, but it will have much bigger impact on, on other areas than just drivers. Yes, we have you know, some three million drivers, professional drivers in, in the country, but it's also gonna impact disc jockeys, it's gonna impact radio executives, it's gonna impact all of these other industries uh, that we need to think about. And so uh, we do a very good job at, at seeing the first order effects, we do a very poor job at thinking through the second order effects, and that's what we need to, uh, to start thinking about. Uh, and then the third point I'll, I'll make quickly just with a, with a story from history. This is what, what technological evolution looks like in our country. Uh, in, the late eight, in the late 1800s, there was about 90,000 people who were ice harvesters in the country. So these were people who would wait for the Hudson River to freeze over, and then they would go out and they would cut big blocks of ice out of the river. And if you look at old photos from the late 1800s of the Hudson River, you will see that running up and down both sides are warehouses. We would cut ice out of the frozen river, we would store it in the warehouse, and we would wait six months until it got really hot in New York City, and then we would truck this ice into New York City and sell it. So about 90,000 people are doing this job. About 25,000 horses are involved in ice harvesting at the time. Uh, and then we learned to refrigerate ice, to freeze ice, and we realized we don't have to then store it, we can then produce it at a central location. And so we start to make that transition. And then later on, we realized we don't need to just produce it at a local facility, but we can do it in our own homes. So Frigere, GE, other companies like that started to introduce uh, the ability to make ice in your own home. Now, if you think about that transition from ice harvesters to producing it in a central location to the GEs and Frigeres of the, of the world, none of those companies and none of those people in that transition are the same. It wasn't GE and Frigere who were ice harvesting the Hudson River in the late 1800s and then made the transition to what was next and then made it again to bringing it into your home. But it was somebody new who, who showed up. So that's part of this transition that we need to think about is that those individuals are not only learning new skills, but they're also often shifting to new corporate structures, to new companies, to new, uh, to new industries. So it isn't uh, the companies that already exist and own that space that are then innovating. Typically, it's somebody new who's coming into that space. And so that's a big piece of that transition as well. It's interesting that you shape that in terms of transitions because our, our next look here is really a conversation around the skills needed to make the transition to that economy. Um, and before I dive deeply into that, I would say um, I find it fascinating that so many people um, you know, you, uh, Kenneth, I think uh, it was you that mentioned people are living paycheck to paycheck. That's 75% of our, uh, of our workforce are working paycheck to paycheck. Uh, we should be ashamed of that. Yeah. We should be ashamed of that. Yeah. Um, and what that means, and, and I know from personal experience, you don't have time in your day to, uh, to think about your career necessarily or mm -hmm. you know what am I going to transition to you're really focused on I've got to get food on the table so we've got that and then we have this idea that there's something coming in 20 years and you know as as uh, Sean was saying it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around something that is so off in the future it doesn't affect me yet and uh, I know that uh, at, at uh, the Center for Technology and Workforce Solutions, we're trying to keep a five-year window and really looking at what's happening now and in the next five years, something that we can, we people, can wrap our heads around and really understand and feel a little more. So in, in terms of, of skills, um, you know, we're looking at this, this back and forth of skills versus degree. And how do you measure skills? How do you, how do you know if somebody is qualified for job X, Y, or Z? Uh, so 
I, I'm really, I'm really focused on that right now with our work. And Carol, I said I would come back to you uh, to start this um, in terms of assessing skills and and understanding. You know, I need to get this person into a job. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? How do, how does the how does the military uh, attack this issue? So the military has it easy. People enlist in the military and then they are trained with the skills that are needed. So they are looking for attributes, not specific skills. So the attributes to be um, open to change, open to knowledge. So I think of it as a knowledge economy, not necessarily a skills economy. So those people who are willing to learn the new technology, because we can never predict what it will be. Um, so that's much easier than the private sector because um, even out of the academies and out of our commissioning sources, we're, we're not training brain surgeons. They're already trained and come in. So we are training the skills that are needed. I think the challenge is when our veterans transition, what skills do they bring? And when you're looking at hard skills, they'll be very specific. Those who have worked in communications, and by communications I mean networking, uh, running, you know, setting up uh, battle command systems. Um, or um, public affairs, or um, MPs, military police, those are specific skills. But what we also need to look at is what are the attributes they bring. And then the attributes allows the private sector to train individuals to the skills that they need. And I think it's critical to understand that they're coming out with those skills to adapt, to be innovative. I'll give you an example on the battlefield. On the battlefield, you have, um, you have to go in and clear buildings. Well, it's very difficult to find out what buildings are already being, um, um, already have uh, explosive devices wired. So soldiers came up with this idea of silly string. And by spraying silly string across a building, they were able to see where the trip wires were. And therefore, they can step over the trip wires and not set off an explosive device. But they figured that out on the spot. And it's often that innovation comes from a, a critical need of life limb. Um, and I think that stays with you. So I, I think they're coming out with the knowledge and the, and I hate the term soft skills, but the attributes. I like to say attributes so that they can train for the new economy and the new workforce. We are, we're actually looking at the concept of soft skills. How many people here think they know what soft skills are? I guarantee you that if you turned to your neighbor and had a conversation, there would be pieces of difference. And I think it's important that despite the, the name soft skills, which I know a lot of people are trying to rebrand, um, just defining what that package is, I think, is vital to making sure people have those skills and teaching them, assessing them, et cetera. And so you can, and the military has done that, although I would say I will talk to you about that rebranding of the term because soft skills does not get budget. So we need to change it. If you've got to pick between technical skills or soft skills, which one are you going to put your money behind? But which one is, they're both essential. essential. Let's not. Let's not, you know, uh, um, lessen their importance. Liz, you had mentioned earlier training and skills development. What is, uh, what, what is the union perspective on um, training and assessing and upskilling? How, how, how should we be going forward? A lot to unpack there, and I think the conversation is very live right now, right? That everyone and their brother, sister, dog is talking about um, skills. And because I think we're all so insecure about what the future is going to look like, that it's something very tangible that we can say, oh, OK, great. We can just invest in, in training, um, which we all agree on is, is essential. Um, and the labor movement has had a past history of doing this very successfully in cooperation with employers um, throughout industries uh, over time. And really the key to that success is having um, a partnership, right? And 
um, and joint control, uh, we like to say, because what we've done is been able to invest on behalf of the workers and then the employers invest a little bit, come together, of course, with the umbrella of government and, and educators and, and the foundation uh, that you need to, to develop those programs. But um, the idea is that the work, working person has a voice in how that training gets developed. Um, and I think you used great examples of how, you know, the silly string is a great example of working people on the front lines know exactly how the shop floor operates, right? Um, and so if you're developing training programs, it's, it's absolutely essential to have um, a working person's perspective. As well as the idea that we're going to be investing for the long term here. Uh, part of our problem is, is we're so short term driven. Um, and companies are looking at their bottom line. They don't want to, you know, of course, training costs are the, are the things they like to cut first. Um, but if we're going to make it and, and see a successful transition, we have to have steady investment. And that's what we've seen in our labor management partnerships over the course of time is the employer knows that in order to have a, an industry or a workforce of the future and, and be able to sustain um, uh, even a profit margin in the future for themselves, that they must invest um, you know, looking beyond just one, two, five years to ten years, you know, and beyond. Um, but the burden now is being placed on the individual because of the lack of long-term thinking. Um, the employers offloaded the responsibility for trading people to the government. The government doesn't necessarily have the adequate investment, right? Um, we have WIOA, but... Um, but we're we're going to ask the government folks about right. that just now. So now it's the individual taking on that responsibility and we know the levels of debt that if you go to college these days on average people are graduating with $30,000 in debt um, and then no prospect of getting a good paying decent job to help pay off that debt and be able to provide for your family. So in the model that I'm speaking of um, in terms of the labor management partnerships that we've seen in industry after industry, and it's not just construction. People like to think of unions as construction. We're talking healthcare. We're talking the hospitality industry. We're talking about all workers now are tech workers, right? And so um, we, um, we are able to fund an earn while you learn kind of model. Um, it incorporates a lot of work-based learning so that it's classroom uh, instruction along with uh, on the job experience. Um, and that then is trained to an industry specification that's recognized across employer. So that workers themselves have portability with skills, that they can actually not be just working at a single company, but then be able to move throughout the economy and that assists with obviously upward mobility and, and opportunity um, for working people. There, there, I, yeah, sure. I mean, David, I think one of the things we miss though when we think about reskilling and, and upskilling is that it isn't a, a like a series of skills that can be taught in a single setting and then passed forward. So as we automate routine tasks, we're left with non-routine tasks and non-routine environments. You look at like military applications that Carol could speak to, that's a lot of non-routine tasks and non-routine environments. And that's where you get some of that innovation is because you're dealing with these non-routine environments that you can't just uh, to take in a single way and train somebody to do in a single way and then you can run everybody through that course and send them on their way. I think it's one of the reasons why you've seen such an increase in apprenticeships over the last couple of years and, and because it's a way of gaining that on the job training in a world where we're automating the routine tasks and we're left with these non-routine environments. Every big corporation has already been dealing with this. The bigger the corporation, the more specialized the skill set. I would argue moving forward, as we start to automate more routine tasks, you're going to be left with an economy full of specializations. And you already see it in healthcare, and you see it in some of these other sectors. And, and so we need to, when we think about training, we need to think about training for these specialized tasks. When I talk to tradesmen, whether it's uh, you know pipe fitters or or bricklayers or others, we're 
we're already automating some of the routine tasks. There are great robots that lay really good brick walls if you want nice straight brick walls. They don't today yet handle corners very well. They don't handle special applications very well. And so the, the future when I talk to bricklayers or to pipe fitters or to uh, tradesmen is that they're going to be doing more specialized skills. And if it's going to come to them, it's going to come to everyone else. I think most in this room probably already see that. And so that's what we need to think about when we're thinking about this idea of upskilling, is that it's very specialized skills, even though we talk about it in very general terms. Look, I, um, I want to be sure we have time for questions from everybody. But before we get there, I want to hear what the governors and uh, the, the feds have to say in terms of uh, training and portability and uh, the policies around that. Tiffany, why don't you start? Um, is, what we're seeing a lot of is governors really tr advocating for this concept of lifelong learning. To, to Sean's point, not just a kind of a one and done upskill today, what are we going to do tomorrow, but really having citizens rethink their approach to learning. And it's not always a four-year degree, it's not always associate's degree, it's not always these traditional kinds of routes that we've, that we've done. Instead, it is how do you approach the skills that you need and are you as a citizen, as a worker, you know, um, given the opportunities and the need, and also just thinking that way, thinking about learning as a lifelong opportunity, thinking about skills as something that you're always trying to, to move forward. Governors are also looking at it um, in, I think, a, a, a holistic way in that, you know, they're thinking about, um, you know, how can they work with the private sector to put in, to get, you know, put in opportunities for skills and learning. I'll give you a, an example from Indiana. There was a company who made a greenfield investment. Um, it was a plant. Um, unfortunately, they came and found out that they didn't have the skills locally for the, that advanced manufacturing plant. So they worked with Ivy Tech, which is an Indiana-based um, vocational and associates uh, school, to actually put together a program for that. But so now they're invested in the community, they're invested in the workers, and they're also getting that training that they need. So we're looking for programs that really can, you know, help on a lot of different ways. So can it? What's what's going on on Capitol Hill for us? Well, I think it's first it's early to say what our long-term agenda is going to be, but I'll just uh, flag something that I saw in, uh, that, uh, with respect to Davos last week and the, the big conference there. Um, I give a lot of credit to them for putting out a report encouraging work, uh, businesses to reskill workers rather than fire and rehire new, um, right? But that report showed that only one quarter of those who are going to lose their jobs due to automation in the coming years can be profitably reskilled by their employer. So what the heck else are we going to expect for the other three out of those four, right? So you know, we, we have to really put our time and attention on in investing in our worker training and in our infrastructure and in our people. I'm not a pessimist, right? I think we can survive this next tr transition better than the one that we have already undergone. If we make the, if people demand that we make the investments that we need to make, and recognize that people in America work too damn hard, need to take vac more vacations, and should be able to enjoy flexible work schedules, portable benefits, and reduce work weeks if they want, so they can have a life and raise their family and actually enjoy this life. These are not. It's 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 wild that that's somehow controversial in this conversation, but. It, I, we have to do something. We have to rethink how we're going to make this transition because we're going to be other, otherwise left with dozens more Rust Belt towns and states chasing short-term um, hits of jobs like the carrier investment in Indianapolis, which is a complete failure for working families, but great for robots and great for short-term headlines. And, and unless we respect the, the difference, and, and unless we respect long-term capital investments and long-term thinking in our businesses, rather than chasing after short-term quarterly earnings statements, uh, if we can if we can do those things, I'm a, I'm an optimist about how we can handle this challenge. I have a perspective yeah. to bring. So, Department of Defense saves lots of money by reskilling veterans who transition. And you might ask why? It's because if veterans don't have a job when they get out. They have unemployment. 
So you're talking billions of dollars in unemployment. So you'd like to think they're doing it just to take care of our veterans, but really it's an economic, along with other things, it's an economic decision. So there's incredible reskilling programs with the Department of Labor, with IVMF out of Syracuse University where we train in, in uh, highly technical skills. Microsoft Academy has created a transition program. And DOD is underwriting these and promoting this which is training the, the new workforce, but it's also out of a need to not have to pay exorbitant amounts of unemployment, which many people might not be aware of that. So there's a great model out there. Well, thank you for that. So um, my job just got a whole lot easier because for the next seven to 10 minutes, all I have to do is point. <laughs> um, questions, uh, I've got one here. And David, maybe just repeat the question because I think there would like to. Um, there's, a there's a microphone right there. <laughs> you thought your job got easier. I'm not sure it's on. <laughs> not on. It's not on. Hi, I was interested. Is this on? Yep, you're in good. Interested in somebody addressing the question of technology constraining jobs so that jobs that used to be interesting are less so, and that things like legal liability drive people to behave within narrow kind of system dictated uh, constraints. Thank you, Sean. Sure. So are, is, are, are we becoming the robots, I think is the question, right? Um, and I, I mean, I think that the piece that you miss on and that some of the panelists have hit on is that there in any given environment, there ends up being a tremendous amount of, of innovation and intuition that, that comes into play. And I think that will continue to be the case for a very long time. So as we think about transitions, the hope is as you automate some of these tasks, it then frees up that, that installed expertise to then do, uh, to do other things. Um, and I think you definitely see that in you know, in, in healthcare for sure, where you've got people, uh, b by having some of that information, being able to parlay that into to other, sp you know, to other places and other spaces. Yeah, um, I'll be on the lookout for some examples of that, but from what we've seen, I, I agree that the goal here is that the technology actually will um, allow, free up humans to actually unleash their creativity and potential in new and different ways and get rid of some of the more routine, you know, boring, dirty jobs that nobody wants to do, right? Um, and we're seeing right now, um, we've got technology introduced in, in workplaces where humans are working alongside a cobot, for example. Um, and um, I think the idea here is that we're gonna be working a lot in teams and that, again, employees or workers have the ability to have enough of a voice at the table to look at how work processes are designed before they're implemented and that we have a voice in that process so that we can flag, you know, concerns that might be uh, on the horizon, whether they be legal liability or workplace safety or, you know, whatever the, the case may be. Because again, the working people that are doing those jobs now are the ones that have the expertise in knowing how those systems operate in a workplace environment. And we have been, I mean, we have been automating pieces of our, our workforce for decades. The first digital computer showed up in 1942. The first hard drive showed up in 1956. So for a very long time, we have been uh, automating pieces of that. And in all of our professions, we can think of things that have been automated during our profession that we no longer do, but yet it hasn't resulted in us spending the, that free time on the beach. You know, we, we're, we've yeah. deployed that in some other meaningful way. 
I just, you know, I, I just had an example briefly because you looked for one. But like, think about automobile claims when you have a car accident, right? It used to be they'd send an adjuster out to your to your body shop and take pictures. Now you download the app, you send the pictures themselves, and so the claims adjusters are sitting in a in a conference room or in a, in, a, in an office park somewhere, right? I know that because we had a person testify to us who had, who had started his career as a National Weather Service weather reader until Reagan outsourced that to a computer. Talked about his jobs in copier sales, bank teller. He listed 10 different careers that had been impacted by automation. Every single time he had gotten in a job for more than five or six years, he would find himself out, you know, removed, redundant, outsourced, whatever. And what are we doing for that family, right? We're, we're causing tons of uncertainty. We're making them move um, to, find the to find the next line of work. It's just that's that's the, that's what that's what we're finding in this economy. And our policymakers, I think, are are <coughs> behind the curve. That's right. right. That's exactly right. Um, that's and exactly so right. we're already seeing in the healthcare space. You know, you can do sort of e healthcare visits, right, where you take a picture yep. of a little spot on your hand and you can set it to your doctor and get a diagnosis and a treatment plan. Um, and to me, that is. We want those kinds of Absolutely. conveniences, right? Absolutely. We want those kinds of innovations, but at the same time, what are what are the policy underpinnings of making sure that privacy isn't violated and, and liability concerns are addressed? Yeah, I mean, and, and if you look, it's about the second order effects being much bigger than the first order effects. So the second order effects are the big societal cultural shifts that take place. It isn't that we just automate that piece. Dishwashers, washing machines, dryers, that automated some activities we were doing in the home and it freed up entire groups of populations to go find jobs outside of, of home production. And so there were massive societal shifts as a result and cultural shifts as a result. Yeah. And so those are some of the bigger things that are, that are coming that I don't think we're thinking about at all. Also something that, that troubles me is there's two different things that we need to be doing simultaneously in terms of workforce training and um, uh, skills. The, there's all of the folks that are in the system now that need to learn these skills, um, that need to know how to upskill, et cetera. But there's also the educational system that is bringing up future generations. And we need to change, I think, the way that provides skills, um, and in particular, the ability to continue to learn. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, then we will always be doing this remedial work. And I think that's important. I saw a question here. Yes, sir? The microphone. There you go. Um, my name's Rob Smith, and I come at this a little differently. Um, I'm with a new association. I'm forming the Youth Sports Collaborative Network. And just briefly, it's those nonprofits that are providing youth development through sports to underserve kids and so to get to your end point they spend a lot of time in make in trying to help these kids not only get more fit to the problem that you were talking about dr ecker but also the issue of getting through high school maybe going to college but i'm wondering whether they need to think a little differently in terms of how do they prepare these kids for this new world what should they be advising them because a lot of them do do employment and career training so if we could have maybe focus on the youth aspect and how they're going to get, particularly with a, a group that, you know, are already behind the curve given the economic situation they have in, in, from their families. We have about a One minute sentence. to respond. One ah. sentence. We have to treat education as a lifetime experience, not something that ends at K through 12 or after a four-year degree or at any stopping point. Lifetime. One thing at Comcast, we are working on our um, digital access digital literacy, so Internet Essentials brings low-cost Internet to low-income families, and we just expanded it to low-income veterans because we understand in your type of situation, it's so multifaceted and you must include digital literacy and digital access to just about anything you do. And I think we also should make sure we all talk about diversity and inclusion because all of these things we're doing, we're not going to get there without a real diversity and inclusion program, not just to meet the numbers, but to recognize that that brings a workforce that we all need. And so we're committed to diversity and inclusion not because it looks good on the year-end report. It's because we have found that it really improves our workforce. And multiple pathways to good careers. Um, yeah. You know, we need to make sure that everyone, of course, wants to go to college, but not everyone is going to college, and that um, we have partnerships at the community level with businesses, with 
you know, unions, if possible, uh, community organizations to make sure that we know that uh, pathways to good jobs aren't always just a four-year degree and to shift people's mindsets to, into thinking that it's highly sophisticated going into manufacturing, for example, in Chicago at Aviation High School, they are teaching kids these incredible skills, you know, to open the doorway so they see exactly, you know, what the education's going to lead to, right? The reason you want to finish this program is you're going to have a really good job at the end of this that pays a family sustaining wage. So clearly there's about 12 other issues that have <laughs> landed on this table that um, sadly we're not going to be able to address. We are out of time. Um, I want to thank uh, all of the panelists here for coming and sharing your views and uh, making us think you know, more than we already do. I want to thank Tim Lorden and State of the Net. Uh, and I've been instructed to inform each and every one of you that you must now go through those doors <laughs> back there to the big room for the keynote, that this is not your Ooh. place anymore. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate Excellent. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome.